cannot control winning. We can only increase the probability of that happening. So the question back was, well, what is the goal of a team? Now, in this particular talk, um, he'll talk about the fact that in a team setting, it's about maximizing potential. So then how do we actually go about doing that? Now, to bring my story into uh, this context, and I'm going to bring up some character attributes that Brett Ledbetter found from these coaches that were the performance and moral character attributes that they felt were the most important to actually help drive the process, which is going to increase the probability of getting the result you're looking for. Now, I've got some things highlighted, which are going to talk to um, my recollections of, of the transformation I first encountered when I went from a kid who was trying to be a tennis player to a professional tennis player on the tour. Now, what he says is these performance attributes on the left are the attributes that govern your relationship with yourself and, ca and the moral attributes are those that govern your relationship with others. Okay, so just to put that in context. Now, let me just share a bit about... Um, my story because when I saw this oh, some you know 12 months ago it resonated incredibly strongly with me when I reflect back I'm now 47 years of age when I go back to my late teens um, I was a kid trying to become a professional tennis player I would consider myself a a decent junior now in the context of that I made Australian teams at 16 I made an Australian team at 18 I won the junior Wimbledon doubles but in the scheme of things, I certainly wasn't anywhere near the best in the world. And I had a long way to go. But I had some success, which kept me motivated, I think, at the time in the game. But I was very result focused at that time. Now, I met a guy by the name of Michael Fox, who um, has been a very influential person in my life, great mentor, he's a sports psychologist. And um, I was at a time in my life where I was close to giving the game away because when I tried to make the transition from junior ranks to senior ranks, I was actually struggling. So I was going to, you know, um, minor professional events in, you know, far out places of, of uh, you know, Australia. I'd drive to sort of Victoria, New South Wales, all over the place, trying to play these satellite events, which would give you ranking points to try and climb the rankings to get on tour, so to speak. And I was struggling, losing in second round qualifying all the time. And I was so close to giving it away because I was 19, 20 years of age. It, you know, around that period of time, Boris Becker, you may not know some of these names but the likes of a Boris Becker was winning Wimbledon at 17 18 years of age and here I am at you know an older age just nowhere near it right so Michael Fox um, grabbed a hold of me and it was the the greatest turning point that I, I think I've had in my life which started this journey for me around this idea of uh, self-leadership what he started with for me was a question about why do I play why do I play the game now you know, there's players like Nick Kyrgios right now, um, who is highly popular in many respects. And he's probably someone that has uh, a lot in that, you know, love him and some that love to hate him and some that probably to dislike him, you know, considerably. One of the things I would talk about Nick Kyrgios is he doesn't know necessarily why he plays. He plays, he's a tennis player, but he doesn't, doesn't know why he does that. So I answered these big questions at a fairly young age. But the main thing that Foxy got me to, change which aligns to what brett ledbetter talks about is that at that time my result was things like i want to be a top 100 tennis player or i want to be you know playing grand slam tennis but that is not in my control what is in my control is things like being the best competitor i can be so when i started to make that shift and i let go of the result and then focused on well what's the process that's going to actually drive that result, which is to be the best competitor, competitor I can be, which in turn is going to increase the probability of getting where I want to go. That's when the magic started to happen. Now, in terms of the character attributes, I've just listed some of the things that for me were a massive um, sh shift. I would say I was full of excuses at 19, 20 years of age, um, full of reasons uh, why I wasn't making it. I was externalizing and I was not taking ownership for where I was. And whilst I was doing the work, I wasn't doing the right work. And there was a massive shift in terms of my accountability and what that, what that looked like. To put this in perspective, um, I was in 1994 ranked zero in the world when, when Michael Fox was working with me. And in September, I played my first satellite event after having a sort of a hiatus and a bit of a time away from the game, focusing on actually trying to become a better competitor. And over the next nine months, I went from zero 
to top 100 in the world in that time frame. Now, for those that don't know anything about tennis, that is an enormous uh, shift. I did not do anything different in terms of, you know, I used the same rackets. I had a very similar training regime. I was still going to the gym. I was still running. I was still spending the same amount of time on court. But the purpose and the specificity around what I was focused on shifted and there was far more accountability about what I knew was going to increase the probability of getting that result that I wanted. And I let go of the results, so to speak. And that's when I had that transformation. So in nine months now, I'm in the top 100 in the world and um, I'm now spending the next 12 years, I guess, on the, on the professional circuit. So that's just for a bit of context around this idea of um, self-leadership and where that started and, and, and the idea of high performance. I now want to shift the conversation a little bit more to this idea of sustainable performance. And I've developed a, a self-leadership model, which I'm not going to go into great detail today. I'll just touch on different elements. I've been in, I don't know how many rooms over the last eight years. So the last eight years, I've been a consultant. Um, I have the privilege of being in front of a lot of people, facilitating leadership programs across multiple sectors. And I've started to see a lot of patterns over that time. Now, in terms of four things that I have seen time and time and time again in every single room that I've been a part of is one, people are struggling with this idea of reactivity. Okay, now this is going to come as no surprise, but the first one is reactivity. People are telling me I am just on the hamster wheel, never catching up, just competing demands. It just never stops. Information overload. That's the first thing. The second thing is that reactivity is creating a feeling of inefficiency. So I know I'm doing a lot of stuff, but I don't necessarily know what impact that's having or how to prioritize or where to focus my energy. I'm just doing stuff and I'm inefficient. The third is people are feeling disconnected from either themselves or others because of the crazy world that we live in. It's busy, it never stops, and we're not necessarily spending time doing the things that we enjoy or spending time with people that we enjoy spending time with. So there's a feeling of disconnection. The fourth, which is probably the most common, is that people are feeling incredibly fatigued. Tiredness is something that I see a lot, right? So I've been quite curious about this um, these things that I have, have witnessed and, I, and I've experienced in rooms. I went to a Grand Slam coaches conference for Tennis Australia, which is another um, part of what I do. And I spoke at a conference where there was maybe two or 300 people in the room. And what I did is I got everyone to stand. And I asked them, I said, I'm going to ask you a series of questions. And as I ask these questions, I want you to keep standing if you feel like every question I ask, you're doing these things incredibly well. Right. So the first series of questions that I asked were around this idea of self-compassion. Okay. So self-compassion. I said, so, you know, when times are tough, do you practice self-care? Have you got a really good inner coach? You know, like that inner critic that we all have, what's our inner coach like? Is it something that we have in spades? And particularly when we're going through tough times, are you forgiving of your shortcomings that you're worthy, that you're enough, all these types of things. If you feel like you're, you know, someone that, has self-compassion in spades, then keep standing. I lost about 50% of the room. I then went to purpose and I said, keep standing. If you know exactly why you do what you do, what gets you out of bed every morning, um, you're intrinsically motivated. You've got that across your work, your personal life and your community life. Keep standing. Lost about 75, 80% of the room. And then I said, finally, do you jump out of bed every morning with like unbelievable energy? You've got great physical energy. You, your sleep's amazing. You're waking up refreshed. You're emotionally and mentally sharp, connected, and you're incredibly productive. Keep, keep standing, right? I couldn't believe it, but there was about seven or eight people still standing. And my hypothesis going into that series of questions that no one would be standing because this stuff is incredibly hard. Now, if you're someone in this room that's thinking, I would have been standing, I, I want to meet you and I want to talk to you about what you're doing and how you're doing it. Because this stuff, I reckon, is the very thing in part, and maybe it's in more than one part, that prevents us from actually achieving sustainable performance. I've struggled big time in my life with self-compassion. So what I mean by that is that my school of thought is if you're struggling, harden up. If you're tired, go harder. 
I, I've just had this obsessive kind of approach and it is unhelpful. You've got to learn how to dial it up when you need to dial it up and know when to dial it down when you need to dial it down. And you need to dial it down, particularly when you're struggling, not when you're tired and frazzled and think your mindset is just push harder. You know, some of these motivational videos that we watch, I think they're great and they get me going too, but some of them I don't think are that helpful. We've actually got to be smart enough to recognize when we need to look after ourselves. So self-compassion is something that um, I have battled with. In terms of purpose, um, one of the things that I believe gets us misaligned is not having a sense of why we do what we do. And as an athlete, and for those that follow um, either athlete transition or military transition, it's actually not a very good picture a lot of the time. What I mean by that is a lot of athletes and a lot of military people, when they leave what they do, they struggle. Mental health challenges, loss of sense of purpose, all these types of things. I've been exceptionally lucky in my life because I've always had a clear sense of what it is that I love to do. I love to compete, which is for me, and I don't get a chance to do that very much these days, but that's a big part of why I did what I did. I love to compete because the challenge and what you get from competition in terms of your own development is extraordinary. It's one of the most vulnerable things we can do. I love the challenge of that. These days, it's all about serving others, trying to unshackle the stuck, people who are going through tough times. I want to do more and more of that work. And if we don't have that sense, then I think the work we do is harder. We have to find extrinsic motivators to get the work done as opposed to just genuinely loving what we do, which will give us the, the zest or the pep in our step to get things done. So purpose for me, um, I believe, is one of the reasons why I was able to go from tennis to golf because that's a big transition. I love the game. I was prepared to do the work and I didn't care about the result. I just wanted to find out. And it's amazing if you throw yourself into the deep end, what's possible through that idea of purpose. Um, lastly, um, this idea of energy. Now, um, when you look at this model, some of you might say, look, geez, you know, I'm really good at the energy stuff. I'm not sure about my purpose. I could really improve my self-compassion. It doesn't matter. It might just give you some understanding or some building blocks around what are some of the things that you can focus on to increase the probability of achieving sustainable performance. Now, in terms of the energy domain, one thing that um, I learned early on is there's a big difference between physical energy and emotional energy. So to put this into um, picture, I've just put a bit of an analogy up on the screen here. Now, the analogy is looking at an athlete's life or world and that of a leader or us in corporate life, whatever way you'd like to define us on the right now, okay? Now, it's pretty small, so if you can't read it, basically on the left, the life of an athlete is one where you train a lot more than you actually compete. So you, most of your week, most of your time is developing, training, getting ready for something. You compete far less. You actually focus on this idea of strategic recovery. So if you are trying to perform at the highest level for something in the future, then every single day when you work hard, you have to do all the right things to make sure you can bounce back the next day to either keep the workload the same or certainly increase it. Now, that includes nutrition, sleep, hydration, getting treatment from professionals, you know, looking at data, whatever it is to actually get yourself ready to perform the next day. If we don't do that stuff well, you're going to be injured in a pretty short space of time. There's this idea of periodization, right? So the whole year is not just go, it's get ready for something, come off the backside of something, have a break, then start building again. And that can be done in, you know, three month cycles, six weeks blocks, or even in a week, you can actually periodize what you're doing. You have a, an amazing team around you that's helping you trying to be the best you can be. You have an off season, which is a luxury, and you've got a really short window in your career. So you kind of really focus for that period of time. Now, if you overlay that into our worlds these days, we are getting little training, right? So we're not doing much training. We're on the job training. You can, we could have a debate about that, um, but we're on for 50 plus hours a week. It's just go, go, go. There is no kind of, periodization there is little time for anything like this idea of strategic recovery we don't don't have a team around us that can help us be our best i mean who's got a mentor or a coach in this room 
Yeah. Okay. And mentor or coach? Both. Mentor. mentor yeah. Mentor is more common than, than an actual coach. Now, a mentor is someone that has subject matter expertise that can give us information, but a coach is someone that can, and mentors can too, but really ask great questions, hold us accountable, slightly different skill set. But if, if you've got a great mentor, they can do both. Um, we cut back on sleep. We cut back on things to actually fit things into our week. Again, we've got 168 hours available in a week. And I'll tell you what, if you look at your diary, it's pretty jam-packed. And we've got this um, really long window. It's a 40 plus year career where as we get older, it gets harder and our lives get more complex. You know, kids, families, more senior roles, while our biological decline is in, you know, in, um, in train. So we can do things about this, but if we're trying to perform over a long career, then we've got to be thinking about that idea of sustainable performance. Now, in that context, I did this stuff incredibly well on the left, but this is where I had a, a, a moment um, of, I guess, an epiphany of sorts. I'm married now with three kids um, and my first wife, Kelly, passed away of cystic fibrosis when I was 25. She was 23. And I spent two years in the wilderness, so to speak. You know, obviously, you know, you know the reasons why. I mean, I was in a, in a, a state of grief and, um, you know, trying to find my place in the world. But the thing that I learned is that if you do a lot of things for yourself physically from a strategic recovery perspective, there is a, there, is a, um, there is a benefit for us from an emotional or mental perspective. But what I learned is that you actually need to spend time on that stuff as well. You will increase the chance of being in a good spot mentally and emotionally if you're doing the stuff physically, but you actually kind of need to do both to do it exceptionally well. And I learned that the hard way. So when she passed away, I was pushing. So the old self-compassion before wasn't going very well. I was kind of in a bit of a suck it up mode, like hard enough. And I was having panic attacks in about six months after she passed. I was in a pretty bad way. So that was my learning of we are as, as mentally, as much as we think we're mentally tough and resilient, I find that most of us, if you think of a cylinder of water, most of us are at the, at the top of that thing lapping over. And now if life T-bones us from the side, there's nothing in reserve and we spill over. Our job is to build that cylinder to the biggest engine we can possibly build in terms of capacity, but always leave room in reserve for life to, to T-bone us and for things to T-bone us because it's going to happen. And if we're, we're teetering, then that's when things can, can uh, you know, get us into a state that we don't want to be in. Now, in terms of just, and I, I won't go into, I'll share these slides around, Will, too, by the way. I'll feel free to share them around. Um, in terms of what's in the energy space, it's massive. And I'm not going to go into detail today. I'm going to share a little bit on strategic recovery, just because I think it's a, a really important thing. Um, what you'll see on this is that in energy, there's a lot of things that I would classify as a practice. So gratitude, mindfulness, growth mindset, reframing, et cetera, these types of things are a practice. They're not something you can just click your fingers and go, I'm good at that stuff. You actually have to work at it. Whereas on the right, there are things that we can action and do, things like exercise, nutrition. You know, They're things we don't like to do necessarily. Some love it, some don't, but we can just get it done. It's a discipline that we have to try to um, put into our diaries in a week, on a weekly basis or in a daily basis. Now, um, in terms of the strategic recovery focus, I thought it might be interesting just to touch on a little bit of science of this for those that are interested so most of us have a garmin watch or a you know an apple watch or something like that that will give you the ability to do some hrv work or heart rate variability monitoring everyone who is familiar with any of this stuff sort of i mean yeah most few of us yeah so um there's a there's a lovely uh, have, you, have you seen the aura rings come out there's a there's an aura ring now uh, that worth having a look at. They're about 300 US, 350 US, and obviously a nice looking ring connected to your smart device, and you can get some great data out of, the, out of that as well. Because the thing about a lot of these devices, they're not as accurate as you think they are. Um, and you actually, if you want to do it properly, you probably need to go to a company like First Beat or someone like that to get a proper heart rate variability monitor and wear it for about 48 hours or so just to get a, a true picture of what your recovery is like. But in terms of HRV, um, really what it's looking at is your autonomic nervous system and how much time you're spending in a sympathetic uh, response 
which is that idea of fight, flight, freeze, or how long we're spending in a parasympathetic response, which is our um, rest and digest kind of response. That's our recovery or rejuvenation um, cycle. We should be spending approximately about eight hours, 20 a day in a parasympathetic response. Okay. Now to achieve that, that requires us to really know how to slow down and to genuinely recover. Yes, the bigger the engine we have, it's like if you've got great cardiovascular fitness, when you do plug into the socket, I mean, you're running at a full 240 volts. So your recharge capability is better than if your cardiovascular system is not quite as good, but you can still achieve very good recovery and at the same time work on your cardiovascular system. But basically, if you're not getting the proper recovery. So if you're someone that might go to bed at 11 o'clock at night, you think you're getting seven hours sleep and you may have got seven hours sleep, you wake up at six and you're feeling tired. And for those like Will, who's got young kids, I'm sorry, I've got no um, you know, magic pill for that stuff, right? So I'm sorry you go through a window where you just gotta say, I'm gonna be sleep deprived. But if we don't have young kids or any other constraints in our way, sleep is one thing that we, I think, need to focus on um, massively. And the reason why those who get that seven hours and wake up tired is because you haven't got enough parasympathetic response. Now, to illustrate that, this is just one report. So I've been lucky to um, get a lot of senior leaders at the highest level of organisations across many sectors to go through a you know, wearing of a heart rate um, variability monitor for 48 plus hours. And what is quite uh, interesting for me is that if you look at this report, red is stress or sympathetic and green is recovery or parasympathetic, okay? Now, you can see in a day, this is one day, there is no green whatsoever during the day, no green whatsoever. And there's a little bit of green. So this person went to bed oh, somewhere around sort of 10.30 or maybe 10 o'clock. Little bit of green around sort of midnight, a little bit more green after one, a little bit around sort of four, and then it kind of got better as the early morning hours came, right? This unfortunately is a picture I see time and time and time and time again. And it's amazing how many of those are struggling with performance or fatigue or being emotionally sharp or cognitively sharp. And what we've got to do here is try and get ourselves into a recovery state before bedtime. So it's that last half hour or that last hour before you go to bed that you need to do some work, get off the devices. Because most people, it's like, I get up, I grab breakfast, bit of toast, whatever. On the way, I'm, I'm just going all day long, maybe kid drop-offs, work all day, some exercise because the dark blues exercise. Then you're thinking about transition back to home, dinner, kids, pickups, whatever, engage with the family, watching shows, doing more work on the laptop, shut the device, go to bed, and then the cycle continues. This is, this is what you're going to see. And if there's one thing I would like to stress today is if you can focus more on sleep, that would give you a massive head start in terms of achieving that idea of sustainable performance. Sleep is critical. And there's a great book, um, Why We Sleep, from Matthew Walker, for those that are interested. Um, I'd encourage you to, to consider that. So... So, yeah. So, for a bit more depth, um, one of the things that we know impacts sleep positively is actually some space during the day. So, the reason why I called out no green during the day is that typically, if there's no green during the day, it corresponds to not good sleep at night. So, if you can find a five minute window three times you know, a day just to press pause, like do, some, you know, diaphragmatic breathing or listen to some head, you know, listen to your music and you achieve a parasympathetic response in that, in that period through dedicated work, it's going to have a positive sleep at night, a positive impact on your sleep at night. But what's happening for this person is I guarantee this is a pattern of behavior, number one. And number two, they're doing work up until late. And then even though they're asleep, their, their brain has not had a chance to actually shut down. So your heart is in that staccato rhythm. It's not in that variable rhythm. And so even though you see a stress response, by the way, this could be alcohol, could be sugar, could be all sorts of factors that are contributing. 
So how we actually get that sleep hygiene right before we go to bed. So shut down alcohol within two to three hours of sleep, not, not, not too much sugar, um, what we eat, when we eat, did they do any strenuous exercise within a window? All these factors will contribute to that picture. So it's actually working with them to say, where are you at? What's your focus or what's contributing to you feeling like you are in the morning? And let's work with that. So that's a, an important thing to, I think, call out. So um, mindful of, of time, um, I'm sharing a snippet around some of these factors, right? And for me, I go back to what I said at the start, which is high performance is a hell of a lot easier to achieve in my view than sustainable performance. And I can assure you that I have struggled more than once um, in my life and I've been burnt out, I've struggled and it's probably why I love to do the work I do. Uh, and I'm hoping that through this, you may have some insights around what you could be doing against this type of model to lay an, an amazing foundation for you to try and increase the chance of, of getting sustainable performance in your life, okay? That's it, so I'm, I'm happy to, you know, field questions, go anywhere you want, um, but I'm hoping that resonates. Yes? Uh, sleep can be exercise. So, yep. if you wake up at six in the morning and go for a run. I tend to say alternate. So if, you're, if your life is um, complex, kids or whatever it may be, I tend to say sleep in one morning, go running the next morning, sleep, run, sleep, run. I mean, that's because some people like to catch up on the weekends but I reckon sometimes that's a bit too long. So if you've gone five days, five days sleep deprived and then the weekend's a bit better, it's better than not, but it's better to try and alternate. Um, the only thing I'd say from a cardiovascular perspective is that it's better to do two days in a row. So you could go two training, two sleep, two training, two sleep. You could do it that way as well. Yep. I've got three. <laughs> I've got three and, and look, I think the, 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 the critical thing when you're going through that period of your life is strategizing as best as you can. So, you know, if you've got a partner, if you're lucky to have that, then you've got to work out how you can kind of balance the load um, or come up with some strategies that's going to maximize, you know, your chance to get a good night's sleep. But it's, it's bloody hard. Yeah. In that window. I have never done much fasting, to be honest. Um, uh, and I, I'm, I'm not a nutritionist, so I probably couldn't go into that. So they're going to miss that last bit. I've been told if you eat, you're better. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, there's some people have like a five hour countdown. So there's things you want to watch from five hours out from bedtime, like caffeine, then three hours, like strenuous exercise, food, alcohol, sugar. So there's kind of like a window of things. And then one hour is things like don't be on a device, like don't have a shower, read a book, do some breathing. So there's kind of like this five hour countdown timer. Just be mindful of that. Um, but the fasting tr training stuff, I'm not as familiar with or couldn't give you good advice on that. No, I've... So I've seen a lot of people do it from a, a metabolism perspective. So the 16, eight diet or the, or the five, two, I mean, there's different sort of fasting regimes out there, but um, I've never done it myself. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The... Yep. Yeah, so what I do from a, like a purpose perspective, depending if you're working at it from an organisational or team perspective or then the individual level, um, sometimes it's easier to start with the team organisation concept because we seem to be more familiar with that. I mean, you know, Simon Sinek's probably one that's made it, you know, famous. And um, uh, what I tend to do is as a process, I might put up, you know, eight purpose statements of well-known companies, you know, like Google, Uber, Tesla, 
Coca-Cola, Nike, whatever, co companies like that, right? All you see is the statement and you don't see the logo and you say, what company is that? People know which company it is, which I, I think is an interesting one, right? Because we know when you go through a process of our purpose, vision, you know, mission, values, behaviors, everyone goes through that process and we know how hard that is to get right. But even what's, I think, even harder to, to do is to live and breathe those things. Now, if you do that well, then that should emanate out into the market and make you more successful and people will connect the dots and say, look, that company lives and breathes what they do. So we're sort of, you know, drawn into that company. When you, you talk about that analogy, people go, yeah, I get that. That makes sense. Okay, well, what about you? We talk about authenticity and, you know, being genuine as a leader and, um, you know, kind of living your values. And if we haven't done that work ourselves, then I think it's harder to join the dots between what we value and why we're at this organization, but also how do we find value in the work that we do? And so for me, I could talk a long time about this stuff, um, but for me, one great thing to do is to look back through your life and identify turning points that have shaped who you are and what you believe or what you value. Um, so for example, one of the things as part of my purpose statement um, is this idea of unshackling the stuck, right? just one part. Now that's grounded in me going through things like obsessive compulsive disorder. Now I was a kid at that time placing self-worth on outcomes and that's a horrible place to be. And I've also felt that feeling of stuck, whether it's through that loss, whatever it is. And we get stuck often in our lives. And so part of my purpose is actually do work to help others get unstuck. So I think one way to find that is to do that work of turning points what's happened in our life, what is the current result of that, and that will help shape your purpose and you know, what you love to do. So that's one way of discovering it in my view. Yeah. For, for me, it is absolutely what, at, at that level, it's nearly all what is going on between the years. So the best example of that in the modern game is Nadal and Federer, right? So Nadal has a winning record on Federer. They've got 20 grand slams each. Uh, Djokovic is going to be the GOAT, no question about it. Um, and uh, when I look at Nadal and Federer as a matchup, you're talking about someone in Federer who in my view, is infinitely more gifted, right? In terms of just his ability to move, he's like a cat. His shot-making ability, style, hands, finesse, options, it's infinite, but Nadal beats him. Now, there's a lot in that, but one of the things that I rate in Nadal better than anyone I've ever seen is his, is his ability to um, deal with pressure, stay the course and do things time and time and time again with absolute consistency and precision. I mean, he picks his bum with precision. So, I mean, you know, he is just routine and he just knows what he does well and he limits options. And that in itself can beat Federer more than he, you know, wins. So for me, developing your mind is critical, um, but that's not to say that you, don't need weapons. So in a tennis setting, there's three things in my view you need. Be a great athlete, be a great competitor, and you need weapons. Now, if someone like me, I'm a little guy, you know, it's pretty hard playing Philippusis or, you know, they're six foot five, they serve at 245Ks an hour, I serve at 205. You know, you, you're, you're a bit on the back foot, but that's not to say that you can't find a way through that. But if you've got weapons, if, if you've got two guys with the same level of competitiveness, and one's got more weapons, it stands to reason they're probably going to win more often than not. That just goes to show how good Nadal is between the years. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've played with a guy, Nick Ahern. I don't know if you, you know, follow golf. N not a pretty golfer. Boy, oh boy, was he effective. You know, didn't hit it far, didn't do much with the ball, but just knew what he did well, stayed in his lane, didn't give a rat's ask about what people thought. He just, he just focused on what he needed to focus on and maximise his potential. Got the results. I think you need to be, I think you need to be selfish. Um, I think you need to be selfish 
Uh, okay. Is sport a selfish pursuit? 100%. 100%. But I think you can have boundaries around that. So when is it a time to be selfish? And then when is it a time to actually, you know, not be? And we've got great examples of that. I mean, you know, the, the champions of the past, uh, some of the most humble people you'd ever want to meet, you know, people who follow tennis, like in my, in the men's game, you know, Laver and, you know, Emerson and these types of players, unbelievably giving of other, you know, and respectful of other people, but geez, they're competitors and they're selfish when they need to be, but they're good at shifting gears. Whereas sometimes I think these days we've lost that, you know, that ability to shift gears and it's become like self-absorbed. It's about them. And I think that um, one thing I love about Federer, he, he sees that he, the game of tennis is bigger than him. Whereas with other athletes, they think they're bigger than the game. And that's where problems, I think, arise. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, why you sleep, Matthew Walker. Yeah, why you sleep, Matthew Walker. Yeah, it's a good book. And some of the stats in there are a bit alarming. So, yeah. But you're talking about tennis and sport being selfish. Mm. What's your views on someone like Ash Hardy where she talks? Yeah, so um, uh, you cannot get things done without a team. So even if it's an individual sport, yeah. when I say selfish, there's like, there's a time where you've got to be blinkered to be doing the things that you need to be doing and you can't afford distractions. That's just part of the, the job. And so sometimes in that process, some people can feel like that period was about them because they're not necessarily aware about what their focus is at that time. Um, but in a team setting, the team would actually know all their roles and responsibilities and know exactly what role they play. So there wouldn't be that challenge within the team. Um, and Ash is a very different personality, you know, to, to some others. Like, you know, Leighton Hewitt, for example, is very different to Ash Barty. She's not a natural combative person if that makes sense like you know i think she's had to find um a different like um ben crow if you listen to some of his podcasts he's got some really interesting insights into the, the work he's done with ash um and how she's had to learn how to be a competitor when she's not naturally combative so you have to work with the athlete and everyone's different but she's found a way to maximize her potential obviously she's a you know an incredible ambassador you know for the game I hope you, uh, uh, best I played uh, for me was Agassi, but I played Federer and Nadal and, you know, but Agassi was the best I played in terms of a matchup. Um, you know, uh, he just had a better, I had a similar game, but he just did it better. So it was a nightmare of a matchup for me. Um, you know, it was no good, but I did beat him once, but that was a, a, it was at a period of time when he was dating Brooke Shields. And I think if you read his book, um, it, it was a combo of Brook Shields and, and Ice, I think, you know, um, you know, he, uh, yeah. He, uh, so you, I am referencing his book open a couple of times. So, um, but when he was serious and when he wasn't uh, struggling personally, he was better than me. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So this is, um, this is heart rate. Yeah, and this, and in terms of the, the strength of the reaction, so with heart rate variability, um, the formula is root mean squared of successive differences of RR intervals. So what that basically means is if you think about an ECG, the top of your heart rate um, is RR intervals, and they measure the time between each of those and the successive differences and so when you're in a green state, the spacings are variable in timing. And there's also a factor of um, heart rate because you can't be at 120 and be achieving, you know, uh, recovery. But you can certainly have a variance in there around the, your heart rate, but you can still be achieving variability. So the strength of the reaction is what you're seeing in terms of the red and the blue and the green but that's your heart rate. Does that, does that help, mate? Yeah. yeah. Hopefully this is useful. I mean, I'm, I've just picked, I pick some things out. I'm like, could have talked about anything, but.
<laughs> yeah, no. So it, it is giving you a bit of exercise for 30 minutes. So that's where the, you know, eating, exercise, eating. You can, if you want to do it really well, the, the better you um, map out your, um, if the more you input what you were doing at each time of the day, the more accurate it becomes. A um, couple of tips to make. So um, for me, the number one thing is the window from about half hour to an hour before bed. So if you're on the laptop and you're shutting it and then you're going trying to go to sleep, that's one thing try and avoid. Um, you, you're just stimulated. I mean, it's, you know, and, and look, shows, depends what the show is, of course. I mean, I just think reading a book for half hour or having a shower before bed, just, you know, getting away from devices, just gives you a chance. If you're someone that feels like you're a bit stressed, um, diaphragmatic breathing is a ripper. So the military have a thing called box breathing, which some of you are probably familiar with. So box breathing um, is basically where you would breathe in for say five seconds. You'd hold for five, you'd exhale for five, hold for five. You know, you just a, it's a, you do that for about three or four minutes and you'll go from red to green. And if you can do that, because when we see great reports, they, they're, they're green here before bed and then you're in green when you fall asleep but often we see people falling asleep and not achieving any green for two hours so then that's what they're kind of confused i get seven hours sleep and i'm waking up tired because you're probably only getting five hours or four hours of green you know um so that's one tip i'd i'd certainly make and then the alcohol not too much like when i i drink red wine every single night so you know that's my little thing right um but i don't drink enough to one have an impact but also the spacing is enough so if i did it right before bed yes it would impact but i do it long enough before that you know by the time i get to sleep i'm i'm fine because i've done this stuff and my reports were good mm. yeah look um that's and again the window is is important right so and I must admit, I've never been to the laboratory, but in terms of the parasympathetic response, I've absolutely been getting seven and eight hours a night. Um, so in terms of REM, you know, Matthew Walker talked about four cycles of the rapid eye movement and the non-rapid eye movement. You need about four of those, hence the kind of eight hours window that people say is a good amount of sleep. Um, but REM is critical. And um, yeah, I haven't done that depth, but you know, he's in the sleep laboratory and I would lean on him. Mm. In, can't, after what? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, but yeah, but you need to work on self compassion. You see, yeah, <laughs> you're in a critic, strong in adult, you're in a coach. Yeah. Well, you just touched on briefly um, the addiction from. Well, yeah. Because, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Look. Yeah. Look, and and look, it's hard even probably the time we have the to go, but I. Went from tennis to golf, spent five years on the golf tour. I was successful to a point, but I had a, an injury. Then it was like, what next? I was doing some Fox Sports commentary. I really liked that, to be honest. It was okay. Um, and then I went out to, the, uh, to Tennyson to do some coaching. And that's where I met Ash Barty. So I coached Ash Barty from 12 to 14 years of age. Loved the coaching. Um, and then went into sports administration. And that's where I started to fall in love with leadership, culture, high-performing teams. I went through a Melbourne Business School uh, leadership program and the facilitators in that program were phenomenal. And I got a bit of a, ooh, I really like that kind of work, I think. So then I left sport, went back to uni. I did an MBA in leadership and innovation um, because I wanted to have a leadership sort of focus. And then through that program, I met, you know, KPMG, um, PwC, NAB, some of the businesses like that. And um, I knew I wanted to facilitate or do that kind of work. And um, what a better, you know, couldn't find a better place than KPMG to, you know, to learn your craft, so to speak, even though you, I was doing that in, um, in tennis. Uh, in, yeah, my time in sports administration in tennis. And then, you know, that was just a, a, an open, it opened the door for much bigger things, I suppose. Um, but the purpose for me is always about um, that idea of unshackling the stuck or shaping destinies. So I find that people often don't feel like they're capable 
of a future state that they kind of dream of or they think they would love, but I probably can't do that. Or life's like this, I can't make those steps. And I like to try and work with people who feel there's a, there's a ceiling or there's some constraints in the way because I think that's, again, our inner critic talking. And I think purpose can unlock that because once you go, oh, my God, I love this, I want to do this, you're going to be good at it. You're going to work hard. It's not going to be work, actually. You're just going to love it. And um, you'd be more productive, efficient. So if you find your purpose and you've got a good inner coach, there's two fantastic things um, to, to get you going. Yep. With the client mm -hmm. do you do follow ups with the people? Yeah, so I, I could have brought um, more. There was one great example of a before and after. So there was actually a partner at KPMG that he was about 60 and he was really in a bad spot. So I, I should call that out. Like I'm talking clinically unwell. Uh, and his report was diabolical. Like he wasn't getting any green in a 48 hour period, zero. Um, in four months, he had like gold star report and it involved um, physical training, mindfulness, nutrition, sleep hygiene, you, you name it. It was a program to get him um, back to where he needed to, to get to. And that was driven by the performance clinic. So KPMG bought a business called the Performance Clinic, which is where I started um, at KPMG. And Andrew May, who some of you might have heard of, he, he was the founder of that business and then they bought it and he's got some methodologies and he was one that started the kind of heart rate variability process. And, and, um, and I've, been, I've got a mate now who's uh, an ex-SAS soldier that, that um, you know, has these monitors and does that work as well. All right, great. Thanks everyone. Thank you Cheers. Much.